again want to thank First Repair and NARC for uh, this wonderful conference they're putting on. As, we, uh, as I said when we opened yesterday, we'll be opening all of our sessions with the ancestral acknowledgement. We use this to open all of our Evanston committee, Evanston reparations committee meetings. And it just reminds us why we're here, why we're doing this work, why it's so important. With great humility and deep gratitude, we honor the strength, endurance, and sacrifice of our black ancestors. We honor those enslaved African people whose forced labor was exploited for generations to establish the economy of our region and the United States. We honor those black ancestors who persevered despite discriminatory laws and practices that created a racial caste system, legitimized anti-black racism, and continue to plague our community today. It is only by recognition and understanding of these errors begun during our nation's origins and continuing today that we can hope to correct our path. We acknowledge this exploitation not only of minds and labors, but of our very humanity. We grieve for those black ancestors who, despite their contributions to this city's wealth and freedom, were never recognized, fairly compensated, or allowed to fully realize their own sovereignty. Because of their work, we are here and will invest in the descendants of that legacy. And through this process, we work to repair some of the harms done by public and private sectors. Sure. And now, uh, Robin, for, I think she needs no introduction. <laughs> this is not Robin. <laughs> As someone said last night, it's always good to have a little bit of humor in this, right? Yes. You know, you got to have some honey along with the bitter. Uh, in the name of our mothers, our fathers, all our ancestors, I greet you all and I welcome you on behalf of First Repair. Um, that's a little bit funny for me to say that. This is my first time to Evanston. My first time to Evanston. Believe it or not, um, I've been reflecting all weekend, particularly yesterday, uh, this morning, uh, when I first met Robin. It was in November 2019. That was the last time I was in Illinois. I was invited here by an elder, uh, now an ancestor, uh, Conrad Worrell. Yeah. And I thought about this yesterday, Cam, when uh, <laughs> Jaboke said he's probably whispering in your ear. Uh, if those, how many of y'all knew Conrad Worrell? Uh, see, if you knew him, he ain't whispering in our ears. <laughs> he probably cursing us out <laughs> in a loving way. That was Baba Conrad, but he invited me here. Uh, Cam and Cobra Chicago organized a forum on women in the reparations movement. And I had the blessing of coming here to do a presentation on Queen Mother Moore, who I had the blessing of meeting when I was 18 years old, uh, some few years ago. <laughs> and so I met Robin at that time, and they were mobilizing folks from Chicago to come here to support the initiative of creating this reparations fund. And I was just so inspired. I went back to Atlanta and told everything, everybody about it. One of the things that Conrad said in terms of mobilizing folks there is he said, Everston can be like Montgomery. Everston can be like Montgomery in terms of reparations. And we think about what does that mean be like Montgomery. Montgomery is what inspired many of our people to mobilize around desegregation, 
right, eliminating the apartheid system that existed here in the South, eliminating the barriers to vote that we still are fighting around. So he mentioned Everston could be that. That was very powerful and inspirational and visionary. And I wonder, I keep on thinking, Robin, Cam, what would Baba Conrad be thinking about right now? He probably would not be cussing for a minute. For a minute. He would probably be congratulating and smiling uh, from seeing where we're at today. But also reminded of this from Montgomery. One of the examples are things that Montgomery gives to us if we really look at it. You know, we all know the name Montgomery Improvement Association. Really, we just know Martin Luther King, Rosa Parks. But Montgomery Improvement Association was started, it was an umbrella organization that brought in a variety of people from the Montgomery community, brought in the NAACP, brought in the sleeping car porters, most importantly, brought on the Women's Political Council, you know, that put forth and created the flyers for the first day of not riding them damn buses. And so it was a united front. We also have to be mindful that what are the most important tactics that our enemies have to shut down a movement is divide and conquer. So um, many of y'all hear my last name. It means what? Unity. Unity, Umoja, the first day of Kwanzaa. Uh, we have to be very mindful of the necessity of unity. That's not something that's easy to accomplish. It's not something that's easy to accomplish. And so we have to think about the respect that we have to give one another. We have to think about the honesty we have to share, not only with ourselves, but our people. Uh, in this particular moment, it's very important. I heard uh, a sister coming down here for the session last night, and she was talking about how inspired she was to come into this space and that she needed some inspiration to go back and do the work where she had to do it. So part of our being here is intellectual. Part of our being here is you know, political. But it also has to be a little bit like church. You know, it has to be like church. And don't worry, I'm not going to pass the collection plate. <laughs> but what does that mean? That means that part of it, you know, in church, at the best of times, we build relationship. And so when we're here and I see some people I'm meeting for the first time, and I see some people I've been seeing for the last few years at these reparations gatherings, we have to build relationships we have to build trust, and we have to show solidarity with each other. So uh, brothers and sisters, take advantage of this time. Again, we want to thank First Repair for bringing us all here. We want to thank NARC for bringing us all here. Give them a hand. As I now bring you Robin Rue Simmons. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. How did everyone rest? Did you have a good day yesterday? Oh, I had an amazing day yesterday with each of you, yes. Um, you should see yourselves, you look beautiful. Uh, I know there's a lot of picture taking and there's a Hoover app and we have social media and all that, so if you um, have access to that, check yourselves out, you look amazing. Um, I just wanted to introduce our uh, opening speaker. And I'll start with a little story of our work uh, in Evanston. And when we made, when I called the question in Evanston uh, for reparations, I knew that 
I really actually didn't know. <laughs> I knew that reparations was the demand. I understood the case. I knew that I was fully committed to making sure that there was substantial completion before my term ended. I knew that it was important that we had an introduction and some milestone in 2019, 400 years of black resilience here. Um, but I didn't know how much education my peers, my colleagues, and our community needed. And we were fortunate enough to have a lot of incredible partners, too many to mention, um, but we're fortunate to have one here today, Professor Al Tillery. And my colleagues on the Evanston City Council agreed to a closed session training on racial discrimination, particularly black discrimination, not just locally in Evanston, but he went all into the dis disparities in the rollout of the GI Bill and so much more. Um, that really helped prime my colleagues to say yes to that November 2019 vote to pass uh, reparations. And, and so it's important that you all find the partners that you need. Um, and before I get into an academic partner, um, the elders are so important. And so you heard me talk about a personal elders council. It's not an official thing. We don't have board members or anything. And I don't even know that they know that they're my elders council. <laughs> but it's who I call on when I need reference, education, um, inspiration, correction, motivation. Um, sometimes a reprimand comes along with the conversation. It's always gentle and respectful. Uh, but I want to encourage everyone to make sure that you're reaching out to those that have been in this struggle a long, long time. And that's been my personal secret tool is it has accelerated my learning and leadership because I'm able to lean on and build on the work of those that come before me. So if we could just pause and just really give uh, appreciation for Baba A.K., Akinyele Emoja, Professor, Doctor, Dr. Daniels, Dr. Julianne Malvo, Attorney Nakichi Taifa, Cam Howard, even please just make sure that we honor them. It was these leaders that I called on and asked for a recommended reading list and their generosity of time. Not, never once have they said, I'm too busy, go find somebody else. None of that. They took the time and um, established my reparations library, and I recommend that you um, get one of those as well. So back to why we're here today. Um, we had closed session training. We had um, ongoing public education. That's another thing that's going to be very important with all of your initiatives. Come up with some sort of meeting cadence, whether it's quarterly town halls or info sessions or something. Make sure that you keep your community educated on reparations, the case why, uh, and the history. And so Professor Tillery did something else that was really incredible for us. There was a lot of debate, criticism, excitement around reparations, but really we didn't have um, any findings yet. And it'll be a while before we can begin to measure the wealth gap closing and these types of things, but we can begin to measure the sentiments, hearts and minds, how the community is changing and evolving, how that influence is impacting institutions and organizations in town. Um, and Professor Tillery says yes to everything. So the next thing is get you an academic partner, okay? There are many in this room. All the academics in this room, please raise your hand. Oh, okay. All right, way to represent. So these are your partners here in this room, and I'm going to volunteer them because they're here. So call on, yeah. <laughs> call on them. Um, but we have Professor Al Tillery. He's right at Northwestern, and the, the most incredible thing we recently did under his leadership is we had a community a robust community survey and the findings are really really important and I'm not going to give away those findings but I want you to know that it's allowed us to um, evolve our conversation around reparations get past it's going to create a race riot and it's impossible and everybody white's going to move out of Evanston and all these crazy things that you know you hear when people say why not to do reparations that has not been the case in our city and so Al uh, Professor Tillery has made it possible to show in a scientific way how positive uh, and the public benefit and the 
ongoing benefits um, implementing reparations can have in your community. And so I can't give you all his accolades. I know he's like Ivy League and all different types of things like that. And, and he could tell you that, but he's so modest, he probably won't. But the brother is pretty incredible, a lynching survivor. And I hope he does at least tell us a little bit about that story because it really informs who he is. It makes it clear on where his heart, mind, and values are and how fully committed he is to us in this movement. And so my friend, Professor Al Tillery, will you please join us? Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Robin, for that uh, just too kind introduction. You're going to make me cry. Um, so my background as how I became an anti-racist educator, uh, and I see my brother Chip Greenwich in the room here. We go back. 30 years to Morehouse College, man, this guy uh, is here. So he, he, he remembers a young Al Tillery. Uh, <laughs> and so, you know, when I was nine years old, my family moved from West Philadelphia. Uh, born and raised, <laughs> sa same neighborhood as Will Smith. Our grandmamas went to church together. Uh, that playground was my playground. It did look like that. It was a photo of it, right? So we moved into uh, a suburb called Glassboro, New Jersey, because my folks thought I would get a better education there. My dad had gotten this corporate promotion, and they wanted us to have the yard and everything. And so uh, I had been going to kindergarten and first grade with, you know, mostly, you know, black kids, Italian kids, some kids who were Irish immigrants, recent Irish immigrants, uh, and, and, you know, the borders of South and West Philadelphia. And so I didn't really have any, like, fear of white people, uh, as I sort of probably should have had when I integrated this neighborhood. And so on my first day at the bus stop, we rode, we rode to school with the older kids, the high school kids. And some of the high school boys didn't like that I was standing next to a white girl who was the daughter of my violin teacher, literally the only person I knew in the town uh, at that point. And so back in the day, kids would wear these ridiculous now, because uh, my kids don't even wear jackets now, right? So like, they wear these ridiculous thick jackets with these hoods. You could unzip it, it'd be like a cape. And so, you know, I was wearing that. It's probably too hot to wear it, but I, I thought it was fly. So it was like the first, <laughs> first day. So I had it on, and I was proud. It was like an army jacket, you know? And so they basically took that jacket, took the cord, ripped it, wrapped it around my neck, and then took the two parts of the hood and hung it on the tree limb. And I remember losing consciousness, and I saw the bus driver pull up. And I, saw, I still remember his eyes, this older white gentleman. And he scrambled and got his toolkit, and he cut me down, uh, and I lived. And so from that day, I really tried to figure out, you know, what is this race thing that people are so fixated on in a very kind of simplistic way. Now, I grew up in that town. I had a pretty idyllic childhood. I played sports. I was, you know, so it was, it was not a, a huge scar. But then we started to make our sojourns back to the south, to where my people are from in Georgia, Jeff Davis County, right? And so understanding that. And then went to Morehouse, and then went to Harvard and kind of reintegrated that. You know, there was a big revolution my year at Harvard. Three black men were admitted across the entire social sciences PhD programs of about 200 students. Three black men. Wow. So every, every day, a couple of white professors would pass me in the hall, drop out, Mr. Tillery. Why, why are you here, Mr. Tillery? You're wasting our time, Mr. Tillery. Uh, your seat belongs to a more qualified white man, Mr. Tillery. Drop out. Uh, every day. And then I remember being in class with this really crotchety old guy who said, uh, you know, I just came back from helping Ethiopia draft the Constitution, and I have hope for them because they're descended from European stock. And I raised my hand and I said, oh, professor, you do know that the word Ethiopia right. means land of the black. Right? It, well, he's like, I, I don't know about that, but I do know that blacks have never succeeded in democracy. And I said, have you heard of Fannie Lou Hamer and, and Dr. King? And he said, 
what I do know is you should just drop out of this class because you're wasting all of our time, right? And so that kind of crystallized my work and why I don't say no to much is because I don't do this work as just a job, it is a vocation, right? I don't want my black children growing up in a world that was anything like mine was when I was their age, anything like my grandparents was, anything like my you know, great-grandfather George, who was a slave, my great-great, and died in 1958, so my mother was 10 when he died and knew him, right? So, you know, why do I say all this? You know, not just to tell a cool story, but because we are in a political moment in this country where at least one of the major political parties is actively arrayed against us, is anti-black, right. and wants to, we say euphemistically, turn the clock back, but wants to put us back in a, 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 a racialized caste system uh, that looks like peonage, right? right. right? And we've got to be clear-headed about that. We've also got to be clear-headed, and you know, so my bio, I started this thing, the Center for the Study of Diversity and Democracy, uh, six years ago, where we do your translational research. We try to get it out to governments, corporations, and nonprofits, right? And then there's a need for more work, so I also started this thing called the 2040 Strategy Group, where we help politicians and corporations and governments solve for progressive change. You want to do something progressive, we come in, we do the social science and tell you how to do it. Basically all the things that Northwestern doesn't mind that we do, but doesn't really want their name attached to. Because like all of these elite universities, they're really just hedge funds with an educational side business. And so, you know, their first order of business is protecting the endowment from lawsuits, right? And so, you know, it's not really different from my Northwestern work. It's just there's no Northwestern imprimatur on it because the bosses don't want that. Because <laughs> Al Tillery might say something really crazy from their perspective because they've gone and given me a lifetime job. And so they're probably right about that, right? So my seat at 2040 puts me in daily conversation with literally the most powerful people in the country, right? You can imagine who these people are. These people are Democrats. And they claim to be advocates of racial equity, but they're not really defending the principles of racial equity in the open contests around these issues. And so as we go into the 24 cycle, what you need to be thinking about is, is this our last election? Is reparations going to matter if this is our last election? Because let me tell you, like, every day I go into work and I'm with white colleagues who are well-meaning and committed to racial equity, they don't do one-tenth of the public-facing work around these issues that say, I do, and what are they talking about? Will Trump put us all in jail? Because they study places in Latin America and Africa and Asia where people who take oppositional standpoints <laughs> go to jail. And so this is the active conversation in the halls of elite universities. Right? And so what we need to think about when we talk about the work that we've done here in Evanston is how does this tiny blip of success in a country which has always been arrayed against the argument that systemic racism is a real thing that anti-blackness is a real thing, that none of these conversations should be in the public discourse, that the 14th Amendment Equal Protection Clause, which was written to protect black people, 
and to promote equity and equality for them is a burden to white people now. So how will you do reparations in this context when, frankly, there are folks like me telling the most powerful people in this country that you need to lean into the racial equity space because right now you're at 68% approval with black voters. Can the Democrats win if black voters approve of them at 68%? They need like 86% to win. And so if people like me are saying, you got to push, and that, well, what about the Reagan Democrats? Well, you know, they're Republicans. <laughs> <laughs> They have been for 40 years, right? And so the blip of success around reparations, the blip of success in race relations that Evanston has experienced, if I were the most powerful person in the world, I would be looking at Evanston as the formula for solving my problems, right? But that's not happening yet. And so the only way that's going to happen is if you all take the knowledge that's disseminated in spaces like this and develop a political strategy to make it happen. I was once talking to a group of civil rights leaders and they had a meeting with President Obama and they were saying, oh, you know, we, we didn't get what we wanted out of him. And he said, if you want me to do this, you have to make me do it. And they said, that is the throwback to what uh, President Johnson said right. to Dr. King. He's like, we, we have Dr. King and President Johnson on the tapes strategizing. You know, how can we get a voting bill, Mr. President? Well, you know, Dr. King, it would really help me if you would go down to Selma and gin up a lot of activity so then we can send the FBI and all these other folks there. That's a good idea. Right? So you've got to make all of these leaders, even our kinfolk, yeah. even our kinfolk, do things. Right? So, so what do we have on our, on our, to our advantage in this conversation? We've got evidence, as Robin just said, that you can do racial equity work in a city like Evanston and not cause a race riot. Because I tell you what, and I know Robin's gotten these calls, when, when reparations passed, I had a lot of academics from the usual places calling me up, oh, hey, Al, um, you live in Evanston, right? Like, do you know anything about the reparations? Nope. <laughs> but I saw your name in the paper. Right. You did? I'm sure that was a misprint. But no, bro, your, your, your photo, you're at the, oh, okay. Yeah, I do go to the city council meetings. So Why? Because their model was going to be an extractive model. They wanted to come in and define a survey with the basic minimum kinds of questions that would lead to the answers that would fit into their research agenda, which the stable research agenda in political science and sociology for the last 40 years has been explaining away systemic racism. Something called the racial resentment battery, developed in the 1970s. Oh, you know, well, sure, surely people are going to resent helping all those black folks coming out of Jim Crow. And so maybe we need some benign neglect. Right? That, that's who was coming for Evanston. Right? Because it fits into the model of you can't do... So some of you may be from places where you've seen other surveys. Some states. Oh, well, oh my God, like 70% of white Californians don't like reparations. Let's pump the brakes. Going into an election cycle. And you look at the survey, it's like, of course they don't like. Look at how you've defined. You've, you've created a relational battery 
you've asked them what helping people in a racial justice context will take away from them. So of course they don't like that. Do you believe that people in California today are responsible for the crimes of slavery that happened? Well, if you ask people nonsense questions, <laughs> you're going to get nonsense answers. And that's what social science has been working on. Clearly, there are principled economic reasons, Dr. Tillery, I hear this all the time. There are principled economic re reasons why, you know, white respondents don't want redress. You know, th think about the, the, the poor white person living in West Virginia. No one's helping them. And I say, well, don't nine out of ten white people live above the poverty line in, in America? And I've never heard black civil rights leaders question giving assistance to that one <laughs> out of ten. We don't sue saying, oh, tear down the social welfare. Pro like, no, no, we don't do that, right. right? So what we wanted to do in Evanston was design something that would be an honest assessment to give people a sense of where we are, but also put it in the context of the work that had already been done. Right? And so we, we, we did this study. We partnered with NORC at the University of Chicago. Uh, they had expertise in doing mail surveys. We also, because my co-author Tabitha Bonilla and I live in Evanston, we didn't want to have the embarrassing situation of people being like, well, you sent this postcard to my house, and you know, do you know who, because you know, that happened. I mean, we got about 3,500 responses. I got about 25 angry notes about the survey. About 15 of the angry notes were Evanstonians writing in telling the nine PhD level researchers with 300 collective years of survey experience that we don't know how to design surveys. So, so that was interesting. Welcome to Evanston, right? <laughs> but we did get four or five in the, in the normal register, like, you know, blacks should lift themselves up by their bootstraps and so on and so forth. But for the most part, there was radio silence while the survey was in the field. And so, you know, when, when Robin came to me and said, would you like to do the survey, or that they would like a survey done, I, I think I said to you, why? <laughs> why? Why would you want to do a survey? We've passed the ordinance, and the work is going forward. A survey might actually lead to some findings that are going to be difficult for us to move forward with. But Robin is the most courageous leader that I've ever met, right? Perhaps, and you know, and I've met a lot of leaders. You know, at least three presidents, twenty senators. You know, so you're you're up there in my books, right? Um, and so, so they said, no, we want we want to do it because we want to course correct. We want to figure out what we can do to improve it. We want to know how it's landing on people. So I said, okay, let's do it. I expected there to be a large racial gap. I expected, despite how progressive Evanston is, I thought most white Evanstonians would be opposed to the program. I think I said, if we get to 40% approval among white Evanstonians, I would go out into the yard at Northwestern and do cartwheels. And I'm gonna do them this spring, I owe you. Yeah. <laughs> So we, we, we asked two questions. We wanted to know, you know if there were significant racial gaps. We wanted to determine how public opinion lined up with national surveys. The national surveys are all bad, right? There's been no national survey on reparations to find people who identify as white approving of reparations at a clip higher than 20%. The ceiling has been 20%, right? Now, what's interesting is that all of those surveys have been on hypothetical programs about s the legacy of slavery. So what's different about what we did in Evanston is like we're the first survey to look at an actual reparations program. The reparations program is not about the legacy of slavery. 
tightly defined, it's about a more broadly defined legacy, the Jim Crow inequalities caused through racial segregation and, and so on. And so that's going to be something I'm going to ask you to think about as instructive um, for what you should be designing. And so the previous surveys have found large and stable racial gaps in public opinion. That's why all my colleagues from all of these other universities were calling. They want to prove that Evanston's going to have that large and stable gap. And so we asked, you know, two questions, right? We didn't just ask, do you agree with the program? We asked, do you think the program's good public policy for the city of Evanston? And what we found is that 70% of white respondents agreed. So I owe a lot of cartwheels. A lot of cartwheels. Right? When we look at the segmentation by race, we see that white Evanstonians are actually somewhat further out ahead of other ethnic communities. Black respondents were at 64%, uh, Asian respondents at 62%, Latino respondents at 61%. Now, this is interesting because people say, well, there's a drop off, you know, Al, like why, you know, you know, when you look at the flip side, communities of color normally support reparations for slavery at like 80% clips. What's different about Evanston is that we actually have a program where the debate wasn't over reparations or not. The debate was over reparations and what's the form going to be. Or is this the best we can do? And Robin would always say, this is a first step, right? So there's, let's just be explicit, there's an active political campaign in Evanston to tamp down support in the black community. And even with that campaign, you're at 64%, right? Now, in public opinion, if you're getting any constituency to be at above 50, 55% for anything, you're doing really well. Right, so this is a very strong set of findings, right? Second question we asked, has the reparation program increased or decreased your trust in Evanston's local government, right? And here we had net gains in trust across every category. So 26% of white residents um, said that it made them trust the government more. 12% of black residents, 15% of Asian, 13% of Latino residents. And so that's not what you would expect if you pick up intro level textbook on race relations at, at an elite university, right? And so Evanston should be a model. The key takeaways are you know, the findings show that it's possible to achieve widespread support for reparations across ethnic and racial divides. The findings show that progressive policymakers can accrue gains in trust and support from their constituents by making reparations a reality, right? So when you go into these meetings with people who are supposed to be representing us, who get really nervous in election years, and you say, we want uh, a commission, we want HR 40 Pat, and they're like, well, I'm really nervous about what that's going to do to our ability to recapture the House of Representatives. You say, well, in Evanston they actually found that in solidly blue constituencies, your assumption that all white voters are racist, <laughs> your assumption See, the Republicans operate on an assumption that all white voters are racist, so we just, they can just make up stuff. Anti-CRT. They're teaching your kids CRT, which is really interesting for me because I named my son after my Uncle Derek and Derek Bell. <laughs> so I'm like, so wait a minute. Like, you do know that all, like, the Constitution is a pro-slavery document. Like, it's, it's like, it's online, right? But like... <laughs> You know, like, they, they, they can do that, right? Well, you know, well, Dr. Tillery, we've got to worry about the CRT bills. And, you know, like, we, we, we can't afford to lose anyone if we, you know, talk about that or DEI programs. So, okay, so we run studies. Harris Interactive, 77% of white 
workers in corporate America like their corporate diversity, equity, and inclusion program. So we show that to the Democrats. Oh, well, you know, well, still, you know, we, we've, we've got to hold every possible swing voter. So what you can do with these Evanston findings is challenge all of that. Well, well in Evanston, we've actually found that the most supportive groups, which is a solidly blue constituency, are, uh, you know, uh, white folks. There's no race riot. So what are you running away from, right? And then you can sweeten the pot by, and I know, how much time do I have, like the five, five more minutes? Okay, yeah, we sweeten the pot by talking about, you know, everyone's worried about the implications of the affirmative action uh, case, right? So there, the, the, the doctrine that the 14th Amendment has gotta be completely race neutral, right? Uh, that's a design principle uh, that you can utilize. You've now got these states that have passed anti-DEI bans, uh, you know, the anti-critical race theory bans. What I want to say about that is that the affirmative action case, the, 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 the decline that the court put in place when they ruled six to three, that, you know, college admissions has to be a completely race neutral space, right? Except if you're West Point or the Naval Academy, right? And then that logic's been extended by the federal courts to uh, the uh, small business program of the, you know, the, the Section 8A programs of the Small Business Administration, right? The Fearless Fund, which was giving away money to black women founders, they sued and said, you can't give money to black. So you can be a venture capitalist, you can be Robert Smith and have $5 billion. And you might say, I only want to fund black businesses. You're not allowed to do that anymore. Because in that case, you had a white woman who got a half a million dollar loan from her father. And then, you know, Ed Bloom, the same guy with the affirmative action case, went and told her, there's this thing called the Fearless Fund, and it only gives capital to women of color. How does that make you feel? It makes me feel bad. Okay, we're going to sue. And the federal court granted her standing. And so, so, so you've got to put all of this together. Because if that's happening, the same logic can be used to block reparations ordinances, right? So the only way that is going to be sustainable is if we put pressure on politicians to make real enforcement of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the Title VII provisions, right? Everything that we have, right? Because the logic of Bloom, all Bloom did, and Bloom should be hopeful. This is Ed Bloom, the guy for 40 years has been trying to overturn affirmative action. We used to laugh at him. He's not, he's not, gonna, he's not gonna get this done. You spend a billion dollars in dark money to get the court that you want, you can overturn 45 years of precedent. And so if they can do that and their ideas are not popular, your ideas are popular. And they're growing in popularity. So now you've just got to mobilize. You've got to convince the politicians. This is a poll we gave to people at the highest levels of government. Why isn't Bidenomics landing on black communities? Because right now, black communities are worried about gun violence, race relations deteriorating, and the, and the book bans. Those are the top three things on our, in our polls. So you can go right into them and say, you want black voters to support you? What is your stance on HR 40? If we get a black Speaker of the House, is he going to allow HR 40 to come to the floor? We're going to, not, we're going to tell none of our constituents to support you if we don't get that promise from you. Why they will listen? Look at the exits from, 20, from 2020. 18 to 24-year-olds, 65% support Biden. 
25 to 29 year old, 54%. 30 to 39, 51%, right? And so black voters, 86%. One or two percentage points of slippage to Cornell West or Jill Stein in Michigan, and we have President Trump back. And so your talking points need to be aggressive. They need to be as aggressive as Ed Bloom's belief that the 14th Amendment protects him and white applicants to Harvard from having 0.03 less of a chance to get into Harvard because you consider race in admissions. That's what the 14th Amendment was meant to protect against? I don't think so. And so but what happened after the, the Supreme Court struck down affirmative action, I saw a lot of powerful black people in every corner of society go quiet. Because that imposter syndrome, right? And so you got to be strong. 95% of black folks with college degrees in America went to colleges that did not use affirmative action. Affirmative action has helped no more than 650,000 black people since 1968 go to college. That's less than one half of 1% of the black population. But what I will tell you is that if they roll back corporate DEI programs, if they scrap the Civil Rights Act, that's coming next. It's going to be, there's going to be a lot of pain. You're not going to get to reparations if that happens. So I'll stop there. Sorry if I'm one minute over. I absolutely can. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Thank you. Okay, yeah, you, it's, it's your class. I'll stay as long as you want me to. Okay. So we, we released the top line data as a press release. It is on the city's website. It is on uh, Northwestern's website. And I'm sure, Robin, we can give you that, that press release. This PowerPoint is available to you. Um, so, yeah. It is, but I, I will make sure that Robin circulates it to you. It's all, it's all publicly available. Yeah. Looks like a great study, more demographics on uh, the population of, Ev the white population of Evanston. Highly educated, more affluent than normal, um, solidly democratic. Um, and, and I will say why I tell, like New Jersey called me, they're like, we want, I'm like, eh, I would wait. Let's do the post evaluation, right? Because the reason we got such amazing numbers is the work that Robin and Peter Braithwaite and Claire and Matt Feldman and Andrew, like, you know, Judge uh, Jean-Baptiste, right, fanning out into the community, educating people, uh, Dino, about the particular harms that were done in our community. And, and most people want to believe that they're good people. So when they learned about those harms, it's very easy to get to, yes. Now that's why if I were, if I had a magic wand, like I was telling Claire, my kids love Harry Potter. If I could do the Harry Potter wand thing, like I would tell the reparations movement, let's start with the Jim Crow inequalities and then work backwards. Because in public opinion data, that is easier for people to, because the average age of Congress is 66 years old. Their daddies, we're all involved in the Jim Crow inequalities. Joe Biden was a teenager when the racial democracy started, right? Nikki Haley went to a segregation academy. So they all know. And so you, it's easier to shame them around those inequalities. We've also got video. 
We got it on tape. So we can easily press and, and, and bring people on board with those. It's easier than slavery because the legatees are still here, right? And so I would start there and then I would also, I would, if you're gonna do surveys, I would do surveys in the way, a much more sophisticated way, I would do message testing. So what we excel at at Northwestern in 2040 is we do experimental design message testing. So that chart I showed you, uh, how do we know that this is what black people want to talk about? Because in our survey, we embedded experiments where we asked them, do you like Joe Biden? And then we gave them an issue, rank these issues that are important to you. And then we said, okay, that's what they like. Then we said, Joe Biden supports, you know, black communities against CRT bans. He's a big proponent of black history. Uh, you know, and then you show them that, and then guess what? The approval of Joe Biden goes up five points. So you can do that with your reparations message testing. That's what needs to be done nationally. Don't just run a, do you like it? Do you not know? You know what your messages are that you want to get out there. Come to us, let us design an experiment for you to see what, what, what wins in the black community, what wins in the white community, what wins in the Asian and Latino communities. Where do you have consensus? Where are the pain points, right? And so that's what we should be doing with, with surveys, right? But, but by no means do I think that Evanston is the average American community in terms of our white population. I do think they're increasingly the average Democrats. And that's where our power lies. What about the black community? What is the Democrats? Probably more affluent than 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 the median, uh, and but but not, you know you know <laughs> not wealthy by any means, right? More educated than the median, right? Um, ethnically diverse, so a lot uh, interesting immigrant population. We tested for that. There is no divide between people of Black immigrant ancestry, like people from African backgrounds, like my wife, or West Indian, or you know, every, you know, there's there's support across those categories. And you wouldn't believe that if you talked to some of the, the opponents in Evanston, right? So, yeah. yeah. Thank you for sharing so much about how important this is in terms of framing the issues. Um, I've been reading uh, information on how reparations itself can be so good for business and the economy. Did you do any message testing around that or, or in, your, in your work? Not yet, but I'd like to, and I've done a ton of message testing on racial equity uh, and highly affluent, powerful people like the kind of business case of racial equity, mm -hmm. right? You say, oh, you know, if you, if you, if you erase the national uh, racial gap in income, you know, the GDP will, uh, mm -hmm. uh, will go up and the national debt goes down. People love that. Mm -hmm. They love that message. Because, of course, reparations, it's stimulative, right? Um, and so the only reason we don't have more stimulative Keynesian policies is because we've allowed the, the Republicans to gerrymander all of our, mm -hmm. uh, you know, district. So, like, why is Ron DeSantis getting killed? He's getting killed because he posits that all white people are racist. He defines these kinds of very low-hanging policy goals. He goes out there with no data starts banning books, banning gay people, uh, banning black people, banning immigrants, saying he's again, and then we run the studies and it's like, oh, lo and behold, 75% of white workers, including 57% of Republicans, think that corporate DEI is important to make their workplaces fair. No wonder nobody likes you, right? So, yeah, that's where we are. Should we go to this side? Yes, and then at whoever's here, so after Christian and um, brother, Jean-Pierre, Jean um, these will be our last questions. Thank you, I'll be quick. Um, what you're describing around corporate DEI work is uh, parallel to what's happening in philanthropic spaces, mm -hmm. uh, especially since the, pan the onset of the pandemic and the, the ensuing retrenchment, the, the reversal of what was uh, a, a, a windfall of resources with very little um, uh, requirements around yeah. right repayment and, and even application uh, uh, restrictions were loosened. 
I'm wondering if you are doing work with any national or local philanthropic entities to make some of the same cases, provide some of the same data, perhaps frameworks or tools uh, that philanthropy, in terms of a sector, can uh, provide to really make the case across these other forms of what I think you called um, hedge funds. We yeah. talk about philanthropy as yeah. trust funds, right? Yeah. Tax shelters. Uh, and, and if not, uh, I'm the president and CEO of Grantmakers for Effective Organizations, GEO. We have hundreds of, of organizational members, thousands of individual <laughs> members, all in philanthropy. And I would love to uh, explore what's possible. We work with Saul over at the Community mm -hmm. Foundation. We work with all the regional associations across the nation. Uh, and there's some real possibility to, to reflect what you've been describing here yeah. and some very tangible products. Yeah, no, so I, I, do, I do work with some nonprofits. I, I will say most of the people that I give advice to are, are the Fortune 500s mm -hmm. and the venture capital banks and, the, and the, the progressive politicians. But we have done some work with nonprofits. I would love to do more. I'd love to partner with you. Right. Um, I think the, the big thing in the room, and I hate saying this, um, if the Democrats continue to behave the way that they behave and the Republicans continue to behave the way that they behave, and the Supreme Court behaves the way that they behave, we're all going to have to change our criteria for doing racial equity work. So when the Fearless Fund thing happened, mm -hmm. like I wrote to, the, I said, hey, you know, you guys are going to lose. Um, you know, here's how we can design your program. You know, so instead of saying you're only going to fund black women, why don't you say you're only going to fund diverse leadership teams that look like America, primarily with uh, people of all races who are immigrants from the African continent who arrived in the United States prior to 1810. <laughs> those, were all, those were all race neutral criteria. Mm -hmm. And they're like, well, professor, we think we're gonna, we think we're gonna win. And then they lost, right? So, so we, we're all gonna have to start thinking about ways to do the work with this kind of linguistic or semantical games yeah. that will keep us uh, moving. Thanks. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, sort of just answered, sort of just answered the um, part of what I'm, I'm trying to get at. In, Evans, in Amherst, uh, the white settler colony of Amherst, um, we have issued a report we utilized for some of the surveying we did in the community. Um, our University of Massachusetts Donahue Institute. Love your, your critical feedback to some of the things on the report. We've uploaded it to the Hoover app. No, I've read it, yeah, it's amazing. And the, well, you know, but one of the key things is then, it, because we can work either way in Amherst. We've got slavery. You do. <laughs> in Amherst, so we, and we've got the largest, the wealthiest white woman in Massachusetts, white uh, uh, landowner in Massachusetts, is, is, is in our town and her family has been there back to the settler colony, mm -hmm. back to 1759, she's a direct descendant, still owning the land, still having all this wealth, and she knows the impact of slavery mm -hmm. has been, and, and, and is, understands there is a due, reparations due. But then we also have restrictive covenants from the 50s, telling yeah. people you can't, you know, don't sell this house to a black person. Yeah. So we can come at it either way, but isn't it, how do we get it, across, or is it important to worry about getting it across? Look at the Japanese that got the check in, in, under Ronald Reagan. Mm -hmm. Nobody raised whether you've got to use, as our uh, KP law firm that analyzed our, our, our legal prospects, nobody brings up affirmative action law around that, yeah. that instant, because it wasn't a race based. They didn't do it because yes. Japanese aren't white. Yeah. They did it because of specific as you were just laying out, you know, specific yes. history and harm, mm -hmm. a history of harm. Mm -hmm. So why is it, how do we get it across? That's where we are. It's not under the affirmative action law. Yeah, I, I think you just did very persuasively. Uh, listen, uh, uh, I mean, I, I, I think we're going to need to do all of these things because here, here's what's coming next. So the kind of, I, I've got this book coming out, if I ever finish it, uh, it's called The Anti-Racist Corporation Theory Methods Cases, right? And so what I argue in the book is that you have all of these 
race neutral alternatives for promoting racial equity. The problem is that the other side, what they're just going to say is they're going to say, okay, so we kind of know writ large that, you know, slavery impacted black people, but you can't prove beyond a shadow of a doubt, like how it have impacted you. So you don't have standing to sue where they give standing to the, the, the white woman whose dad gave her the half of half a million dollars. Why does that happen? Because the court is on their side. Right. <laughs> so we're going to have to argue all of these things in order to win. And it's not an either or, but, 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 you know, and then, so you take, for example, like, you know, my name is Tillery. Uh, one of the first companies that I ever helped uh, was a company called 23andMe. They do genomic testing, right? So they ran my scan. I'm like 30% Scottish because Tillery was from Scotland, right? So I know the plantation in Halifax County, North Carolina, Glen Burnie. That's where my people were from. My first Af African ancestor, Jemina, was a mixed race woman from Barbados who the evil Tillery guy brought over, right? And so what they're going to say, if I say, okay, here's the plantation, here's the deed, they're going to say, but you're 30% Scottish. <laughs> so you're not entitled to any of it. Like, it's, it's just, it, that, that's where you're going to reverse one drop rule it, right? right. And so we've got to be prepared for all these things. Okay, we'll take the last two. Go ahead. Good. Um, hey, everybody. Christian Harris, Oak Park Reparations Task Force. Uh, thanks for being here. Thanks for the survey. Thanks for sharing uh, your kind of insights uh, to the survey as well. I'm really looking forward to digging into it a bit more. Um, next week or over the next couple weeks. I'm already thinking about how people might poke holes in it, so I got two questions for you. I'd love to hear your response to it, because mm -hmm. I know I'll create my own once I read the report. So one question, um, well, really part one and part two of the same question, but what first question, uh, was the survey done before or after cash payments was passed in Evanston? Um, and do you think that would have changed the results, if so? And then two, um, so when you, when you mentioned that 77% of white people support corporate D, their corporate DEI programs. I was like, wow, you know, I didn't know that. I'm in the DEI space. And then I thought, well, maybe there's a chance that's because a lot of them are pretty weak and they're not really doing what they're supposed to be doing. So I applied that to thinking about the Evanston program. Like, do you think if there was, a, if there was more cash payments or if, there was, uh, if it was a more comprehensive program, do you think there's a change the results of the survey? Well, would look differently. So. Absolutely, and we're going to test for that more. But here's why my, my, my baseline answer is no, I don't think, because the 25000 is real money. And so when you get people arrayed against racial equity work, uh, you know, white respondents, they, I am a taxpayer. Like, I, you know, like, I don't want any of my, this is, and this is the frame that Blumen, why should any of our tax dollars go to one racial group only, right? And so, you know, we wouldn't be at 70% if that frame mattered very much, right? Now, what I do think is that, you know, when you go to, like, California or San Francisco and, you know, the kind of proposal, which may be just, it sounds just to me, is like a million dollars a head, and, like, and you run a survey asking people if they think every black person in San Francisco should get a million dollars, it's not surprising that seven out of ten white folks in San Francisco don't like that. Where is that money going to come from? Like, I also think like part of what we have to think about is given what's arrayed against us, you know, um, we can't let the perfect be the enemy of the good, right? I mean, if our, if our tradition is making a way out of no way, you can argue that justice point but you got to be able to cut that deal. Maybe $100,000 ain't bad, <laughs> right? You know, because um, let's just be explicit. Like, my office sits on indigenous land that was stolen. We know where the people are. That hedge fund is not going to give that land back, right? So, like, you know, you, we can't let pure justice principles obscure what, what we're able to, to do. Now, maybe I sound like those same Democrats I'm, I'm trying to get to move. So don't listen to that. I don't know. You guys, you, I'm just the academic. <laughs> uh, so thank you, Professor Terry, for the, the talk. And um, 
I have one comment and one question. So the question is, um, and you raised New Jersey, and so I work in New Jersey, and, um, and I believe you're aware of Ashley Koenig, who I think is your former student at the Dear Eastern friend, student. former yes. student, Dean Ambar, my so, homie over yeah. there, yeah. So we are in conversation with them about having that survey, and the question I have for you is the use of a survey, one, for the public-facing aspect about marshalling public policy and getting legislatures on board by showing how much the public is beyond this, but then also the kind of internal facing use of the survey to get a sense of where things actually are. And then using the survey, you know, particular parts can be embargoed to get a sense of how much work actually needs to be done in terms of public education or campaigning. And then second, um, you raise this, you know, this notion about how using race neutral policies, this work can be done, but I think, um, I think what some, sometimes that uncovers is the right you know, has been involved in the past 40 years that you've noted, part of the Federal Society, in pushing right-wing judges and using particular issues mm -hmm. in litmus lit yeah. tests. And I think there isn't necessarily an equivalent on the left or particularly around racial justice issues, particularly around the idea that the 14th Amendment in its origins was not only race conscious, but about racial domi ending racial domination. Mm -hmm. Kate Macer here at the History Department Northwestern, as well as Tara Hunter, who is the uh, chair of African American Studies at Princeton, mm -hmm. right, wrote an amicus brief demonstrating this, and Justice Jackson um, has continually pointed this out in m numerous yeah. decisions, right, that the original purpose of the 14th Amendment was not just that race consciousness, but mm -hmm. and racial domination in the United States. Mm -hmm. And so this has not covered up by sort of reactionary interpretations from the Supreme Court from the late 19th century to the current moment, right? And so we have this idea that race neutral policies is the, is the dominant interpretation of, the, of uh, the, of the key, perhaps the foundational amendment in the, in, in the U.S. Constitution. So I, I think you know, part of what needs to happen as well is this like, kind of reclaiming of the 14th Amendment and using that as a limit test for getting justices on the Supreme Court to getting that reinterpretation rather than just have this push for race neutrality, but race consciousness and using the Constitution as a document to end racial domination, right? So, and using that as a limit test for further um, justices in the mold of a Justice Jackson. So I just wanted to point that out as well. Sorry, tell me your name again, brother. I'm sorry. My name is Jean-Pierre Brutus. Jean-Pierre, I, I don't think anyone disagrees with that. I mean, I, I, I think um, Ed Bloom's interpretation of the 14th Amendment is crazy. Yeah. Uh, you know, no, nobody, nobody thinks it's legitimate, and that's part of how we got, um, in my neighborhood, we say, you got caught sleeping, right? Like, we, we were all kind of hanging out, like, pushing the boundaries, right, and, and because we thought this guy was just crazy. But they spent a billion dollars making judges to give them what they want. So let me tell you what happens on the left. People call me up, civil rights leaders, government leaders, oh, professor, and I say, we need $100 million today to start filing lawsuits. Oh, you know, I'll try to raise some money, check back in. Okay, professor, we got, we got two million. I'm like, we need a hundred million dollars. Uh, and, and, and that doesn't happen on the left. If I, if I went to put up a website, like you know, some of these scammer or social movement folks do and say, everybody give a dollar in the black community to file lawsuits for reparations, a lot of folks would be like, I need that dollar. Right? And they do, right? So, so, so the funding gap is huge. That's the first thing I'll say. Your arguments are right, but like, I don't want us to believe for one second that we misunderstand the 14th Amendment or that we need to waste intellectual time. We, we, we already know that they're lying <laughs> and that they're just doing what they want to do. So let's set that aside. And what's the power path? The power path is we need money to fill the course the courts with lawsuits around Title VII of the 14th Amendment because they were so sloppy in the affirmative action ruling, what they actually did is lowered the bar for suing for workplace discrimination. You used to have to show, oh, there was discrimination, oh, your, your boss, it was intentional, and then it caused you great duress or material disadvantage. Now what they're saying is that Calvin Yang, uh, an Asian American kid who had great test scores, 1550, 3.8, a thousand other kids of all races at Harvard had the exact same score. So now what they're saying is that if you don't pick Calvin Yang 
and more people from his group don't get in, why don't they get in? More Asians apply to Harvard than any other racial group. So of course fewer people are going to get in, right? And so we shouldn't waste our time trying to convince those people. They're just cheating, right? But what we need to do is say firmly that we can now fill, because when I go to corporate America to, to help with DEI work, the place is filled with men, mostly white men, who got there. And I've been saying to my, my Fortune 500 clients, can you explain to me why all of your VPs look this way? Can you, no, seriously, can you, can you, can you give me the meritocratic criteria that were used? Do you have the records? Because let me tell you, my friends in the civil rights community, they're about to sue y'all. Are you ready? They're like, what do you mean, professor? I'm like, well, what's the, what's the, st like, all of these women below them, why weren't they promoted? They can't explain it because they're just hiring people from their final club at Harvard or their fraternity or their, their kid, their, 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 their golf buddy's son. And so what we need to be doing is filling the courts with demands for what are called identity neutral decision making. Right? Nobody's going to want that. Okay, I'm, I'm cannibalizing the space. Before you disappear, the, I've been over here like shaking in my boots, contemplating how to say what I want to say. Uh oh. Because I think there's something that's missing in these conversations, particularly right now in this moment, what's happening in the Middle East and the narrative that's being played and how a lot of particularly black led organizations feel some connection with Palestinians and what that looks like in the public facing democracy of the United States. And where does that fit in this context? Because we're talking about affecting voting for 2024. That is a huge component of it. And how do we address that? Well, it, it, that's a little far afield. We have been polling on that because I'm a pollster. And I think you will see that, you know, the administration's language around these things is starting to shift because honestly, like my internal polls, you know, it's, it's not a simple, you know, black and white sort of issue. Like a large segment of the Jewish population does not like the carpet bombing of Gaza, right? So we've got to acknowledge the pain of what happened on October 7th and support our Jewish friends and their families and our allies. We've got to get the hostages back. We also have to understand that collective punishment and the carpet bombing of Gaza no one in America likes that. And so I think... It has been going on for decades. Right, but I mean, the, the, the polls are showing that people want a more nuanced conversation. Thank you so much, Professor Al Tillery.